Electronic media that have the ability to arouse emotions so powerfully that they can cause someone who has already been paranoid, depressed, a loner, blaming other people for all the problems in his life, mm -hmm. say to himself, yeah, that guy's just like me. I'm going to do it, and I'm going to kill more than he did. People are going to remember who I am. Now, of the 10 people watching the coverage who felt that way, only one of them will do it tomorrow. But that's one more than would have happened had there not been that coverage. Hi, I'm Allison Hope Weiner and welcome to Crime Time. I'm very excited today about our guest. It's Dr. Park Dietz. I've been a really big fan of his. I think he is a leader in the field of forensic psychiatry and I'm very happy that he was able to come to the studio and I'm gonna be able to ask him a lot of your questions, I'm sure, a lot of things that I've been very curious about. But let me give you a little bit of intro on Dr. Park Dietz if you're like one of the few people that don't know him. He's a forensic psychiatrist in Newport Beach and he studied more than a thousand people whose lawyers are have considered insanity pleas and you probably know him for testifying in a lot of high profile trials including john hinckley jr jeffrey dahmer and andrea yates so and that's the texas mother that was convicted of murdering her five kids uh which really uh put him on the map in in a bit of a um a negative way but let me welcome you here today Thank you. Thank Good you, to be doctor. here. Thank you, Park. Um, I am so excited that you're here. I, I, as I said, I'm a big fan, and there's so many things I want to ask you, but let me just get started right away. I think that, first of all, why don't you just explain quickly what forensic psychiatry is for our audience, just so they get a sense of what exactly it is that you do. The conventional definition is that it's the application of the principles and practice of psychiatry to legal purposes. And to some extent, that's true. But really it is that aspect of psychiatry that is involved in resolving disputes. And my conception of it is that it's very analogous to the role of a forensic pathologist or toxicologist whose job is to help find the truth and present it clearly, nothing more. And you do your job a little bit differently than other forensic psychiatrists and you've become kind of famous for actually going to the crime scenes. And how does that play into your final report on, on, on determining whether somebody is insane or, or your medical report on somebody? How does that end up playing into it? Well, you know, the whole point being to get to the truth requires that we go beyond the bounds of what psychiatry traditionally does, which is to talk to people and believe what they say. Uh, if you're dealing with criminals, that's a failed approach because criminals lie, at least some of the time. So if we want to understand what actually happened, we have to talk to the defendant, we have to talk to other people who were there at the time of the crime, we have to talk to people who know about the defendant's mental state at various times, we have to understand exactly what was done and how it was done. And sometimes that can be better informed by visiting the crime scene or studying crime scene photos or videotapes by um, actually inspecting the physical evidence that was seized. And from each of those kinds of activities, not all of which are conventionally done, there've been important clues that I've run into that have helped solve the case. Oh. So I think to do it any other way is to risk getting it wrong. Now, not everyone can afford in every case to have all those things done. And in many public institutions, there are doctors who have so little time with someone they're evaluating that they're relying on what the defendant says and a bit of paper. But often uh, in our group, we get boxes and boxes and boxes of documents on a case and maybe interviewing dozens of people to try to get to the bottom of it and prove it. 
And you said that interviewing, if you had some, if you weren't able to do everything, the, probably the last thing on your list would be to interview the actual defendant. Yeah, if I had to choose between all the other information that could be ascertained and a, an interview of the defendant, I believe I would more often get to the truth by doing everything except the interview than I would simply by doing the interview. Of course, it's ideal to do both. Well, let's talk also about um, another problem that befalls a lot of the doctor experts in trials, a forensic psychiatrist and also the psychologist, and it seems to be a lot of times they're just psychologists that are, are doing that job as well. Um, and I wanted to say, you had spoken um, about uh, when you're the expert that you often have a spillover of enormous empathy and concern for the fate of the defendant and that's using your words and in in a trial that's going on right now that we've been talking about on the show and I know that you haven't been following but it's just as an example the defense expert uh, Richard Samuels gave a book to the defendant during his evaluation and during cross-examination a lot was made of the fact that he gave her a self-help book never discussed it with her, just bought it for her, and then he made his evaluation. And the cross-examiner has said over and over, well, what, isn't it true you were fond of her? That's the way you gave her the book. Why does it matter that he gave her the book? Um, and you, we don't need to speak specifically about that case, but why does it matter if, uh, if a doctor like provides something for somebody that they are examining, or does it matter? And um, have you ever found yourself like close to that line when you're examining somebody? The issue is bias. Now, the, the truth of the matter is that we are all biased humans. It's unavoidable. The job of a forensic expert while in the forensic role is to minimize that bias, to be as objective as possible, and to take measures to prevent bias from influencing one's findings or the way one presents them. That's a tall order. And I know all of us get tempted one way or another to feel compassion, to become afraid, to um, be aroused. All of these things that I teach my trainees, if you find yourself feeling those things, stop. Consult someone who's a mentor whom you can trust because you're about to make a bad mistake. When you feel, um, personal emotions aroused in the course of an evaluation, that calls for getting consultation to make sure they don't interfere with the objectivity. Now, giving someone a gift in the course of an evaluation is well over the line of what would be appropriate. Yet, I can see a compassionate person giving someone a bit of advice or telling their lawyer, here's something that would help that person. Right. There, there are ways to be helpful through one's compassion without letting it enter the evaluation process itself. But you find that that's a big stepping over the line situation, even though it's something, if it's something small or anything, it, it, it you think, reasonably calls into question the issue of bias? I, I think it does. I'd, I'd want to hear more of the details. I can remember one case in which I thought someone would benefit greatly from uh, learning a particular technique and suggested they might want to learn that. And I did mention to a family member that might be, maybe you want to provide a book on that, but I wouldn't have done it. But you were careful about it. Uh, yes, of course. Okay. All right, let's talk about your most famous or almost infamous case, the Andrea Yates case. And Andrea Yates was um, on trial and ultimately convicted for the killing of her five children. And you were called in to decide to help prove that she was sane at the time, or in, to decide, determine whether she was sane. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, I was called and asked my opinion. And there were really two issues on the table when I was called in. One was, was she sane or insane at the time of the crimes? The other was, uh, where does she fit with respect to the aggravating and mitigating factors for capital sentencing? With respect to the sanity question, uh, I did all the things I typically do to try to get to the truth of the matter. And in this instance, it was actually fairly simple. It wasn't a complex case in that it was 100% clear with no reason whatsoever to doubt that this was a seriously mentally ill woman. And that's step one of the analysis. Does she have a mental disease or defect? 
every state and the federal government require that step. And so she met that step. Then step two is, if she was mentally ill, did that cause her not to know what she was doing? In other words, did she know she was killing humans? Uh, and did it cause her not to know it was wrong? Now, with respect to whether she knew what she was doing, there was never any question of that. She said always to everyone that she had killed her children, that she drowned her children, that she drowned each one of them as she named them. So there was never any belief on her part that these were vampires or werewolves or demons that she was killing. Could you, add, did you ask the question, did you know, did she know at the time or when she was telling her friends afterwards she was aware of what she had done? At the time, of course. So she, yeah. is there somebody that you were able to talk to that at the time she told them she knew they were her children? Uh, no, the earliest statements she made, and, and now it's a little fuzzy because it's been 10 years or whatever, the, um, uh, she the made issue. early statements to the police. She made a statement to the 911 operator she made statements to the early examiners, to her lawyers, which we're not privy to. Um, and, but every statement that was recorded or transcribed and that we were able to learn about made it crystal clear that at the time she knew these were her children. So that was not in doubt. And she knew that drowning could harm them. So that issue, did she know what she was doing? 100% clear. Now and then we get to the trickier issue. Did she know that what she was doing was wrong at the time? Now, in that respect, she didn't always say. You can interpret some things in more than one way. For example, um, when she calls 911 immediately, is that an indication that she knows it's wrong and that you call the police when something bad has happened? Or is that an indication she knew her kids were hurt, wanted to help? or was it she was in distress? There, there are multiple interpretations of it. What there aren't multiple interpretations of are some of her own statements about that. So in her interviews with me and with other experts who asked her about these details, and not everyone does, or records it, she said that she knew at the time of each child's drowning that it was against the law she knew at the time of each child's drowning that it was against God's will. She knew at the time of each drowning that her husband and society would disapprove and that it was immoral. Now, in every state I know, including Texas, that means she would be responsible. I don't think it was a close call. Even though she was very, very sick, and even though because of her sickness, she thought that her committing this awful crime could help her children avoid the evils of the world and go to heaven on the fast track. Now, if the, if the purpose of the evaluation is, how do we display compassion to a sick mother who's killed her children? Then the outcome, of course, should be that she goes to a hospital but that's not what the law asks. The law asks, does she meet this specific test? And under the test, she was legally responsible, which has the unfortunate name, sane. So even people who are psychotic can be sane if they know what they're doing and know what's wrong. So she actually was taped answering those questions? Yes, I videotape of her telling me the very things I just said. And, Warren, and, and it seems like it would be awfully tempting to say to her, don't say that. <laughs> well, if you're her lawyer, yes, and many lawyers have been suspected to have told their clients such things. So now let me ask you, then you, when you testified, you found her sane, which caused a total uproar across the country. And no, actually it didn't. Um, there was a division of opinion about what should happen. And there were some groups that very much wanted to promote the idea that postpartum depression or postpartum psychosis was a serious illness, which it is. Um, and they wanted to tie um, 
that bandwagon to the Andrea Yates case and make her the poster child of postpartum psychosis. That's right, and that's what I read. About. And, and that's part of the political upheaval that emerged there, but not the only one. So there, were a lot, there was support for your decision? Um, I, I think if you were to have polled the public at the time of the first trial. I mean, outside of trial, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. At the time of the first trial, um, more people thought, good, that was the right solution than the opposite. But the, it, the public was divided, and understandably, they don't understand the test of insanity. They're not seeing all the evidence. And now, in Texas, the test is somewhat different than other states. There's a little not bit really. of a difference. It's, is it pretty? It's pretty consistent with the rest. OK. And then it was reversed based on something that you had said during yes. trial. And yeah. that uh, it was heralded by those groups who had made her the poster child for postpartum disease and who wanted people to be aware of that, the severity of that disease. Because, I mean, and I have to say, for a lot of, for a lot of years, that disease was not recognized. And people called it baby blues and didn't recognize the yes. severity of it. And people were ashamed to mention it, that they had it because it's embarrassing to be a new mom and, and not like your kid or be have bad feelings towards your children, and it's just something that got buried. Yep. Anyway, so just as an aside, but you, it was reversed based on the fact that you had used an episode of Law & Order, and you'd been a consultant on Law & Order um, for the television series, and you, you mentioned an episode and compared it to um, Ms. what uh, Andrea Yates had done. Uh, actually, would you want to not really. correct me? Go ahead. Yeah. So what happened was, in that first trial, during cross-examination, after I'd already given the evidence, my reports there, everyone can see exactly what I found. The cross-examiner, her defense lawyer, uh, wanted to try to show that I wasn't an expert on women's mental health as if that were a separate field. And that's another kind of political thing where I guess there are people who want it to be a separate field. So there'd be men's mental health and female mental health specialists. But it isn't a separate field yet. And in trying to go down that path, he said, well, you're a consultant of the TV series Law and Order, aren't you? I said, yes, I am, two of them. Because at that time, I'd consulted on about 250 episodes of Law and Order and Law and Order Criminal in Intent. And, um, and his next question was, uh, well, that's not about women's mental health, is it, doctor? <laughs> and I wish I'd said, no, it's a TV series. But instead, because I was under oath, I tried to answer him literally and to search my memory for an episode that was squarely on women's mental health. And a storyline came to mind, and I spoke it. Well, come to find out a week later that it was probably L.A. Law or some other show, not Law and Order, that that storyline was. That you were memory. Right. Yeah. Okay. And, and it was many months later before I knew where I had that memory from, which was that the prosecutor had told me that someone had written saying, you know, what she did is just like this episode of Law and Order in which a woman drowns her children, et cetera. And I'd repeated almost verbatim what the prosecutor had told me, except that what he told me wasn't correct. It wasn't law and order, and it wasn't a citizen who wrote him a letter. It was a citizen who sent an email talking about something else. And then what happened based on that? So well, that, told me the untold story. <laughs> well, then um, the Yates defense lawyers who had previously said that they knew I made an honest mistake changed their tune and started to uh, pretend that I'd done this on purpose or that I'd conspired with the prosecutor to try to sabotage their case, which was truly ridiculous. And the most important thing that they never knew is that I'm the one who had talked the prosecutors out of vigorously pursuing the death penalty because she certainly wasn't death penalty material. And during the death penalty phase, after she was convicted, they asked no questions, called no witnesses. I didn't testify so that she'd get life. So. Instead of celebrating me as the hero who saved her life, what they did was to call me a liar who conspired to get her killed, which is just awful. And for me, um, whose entire career was dedicated to integrity and finding the truth, this is the lowest blow that could be thrown. 
I'm glad I was not in the same room with people throwing such a low blow. <laughs> I, I mean, Do you really, think that have, what you said had any bearing on what the jury found? Of course not. But it was found by the appellate court to have, so, and what do you think that was? So what happened was the Court of Appeals ultimately decided that when the prosecutor in his closing argument suggested the possibility that Mrs. Yates had gotten the idea to kill her children from the TV show, that might have influenced the jury. And since I'm the one that had mentioned the TV show, that my testimony, statement testimony. About, the, okay. ab about the TV show uh, had influenced could have influenced the jury. Now, what I didn't know then, and no one knew then, and in fact, it's never been made a public story, is why the judge would stretch so enormously to try to find a justification for overturning this conviction. Because if you read the opinion, the legal citations make no sense. He likened this to a rape victim having um, uh, reversed her testimony and said, I wasn't raped at all. And therefore, the trial, the verdict should be thrown out, new trial should be granted. Well, how is my mistake about a TV plot analogous to the victims reversing their testimony? It, you know, it boggles the mind. Well, I learned why. The judge, at the time he wrote that opinion, had just learned that he was under investigation for refusing to ever overturn a conviction. The only way he could save himself from the investigation was to overturn a conviction. And here's what's on his desk. Oh. So he blames the out-of-town expert. Does it, that doesn't sound, um, it sounds very likely <laughs> in the court system. I mean, and that's interesting. I never, I didn't know that. I wondered about it because it was a strange thing to hang at, uh, uh, to reverse on a strange point given everything else that was said at that trial that that was the one thing that they felt that the jury had hung their hat on to convict her I mean or or that it had any kind of influence there was a lot of testimony besides yeah of course including yeah, the so testimony of how she drowned five children and said she knew it was wrong I mean it's got nothing to do with law and order and in fact when the prosecutor originally brought up the TV show thing to me, I told him, don't bother investigating that. It's nonsense. That's not why she killed her kids. She killed her kids because she was mentally ill. Do you, are you in favor of the death penalty in certain cases? Well, I try to remain neutral to it. Certainly professionally, it's not up to me to decide. Um, I do think that um, we have reached the point in society where we should not be executing those who are mentally retarded, to use the old language, or those whose crimes were because they were seriously mentally ill. And we haven't quite evolved to the point where not executing the mentally ill is fully accepted. We have for the mentally retarded in the Atkins case. And I, I think we're getting to the right place with respect to that. But there are other people for whom the only reasons against the death penalty have to do with its cost and the uh, possibility of making a mistake. The arguments for the death penalty, of course, are the deterrent argument uh, that other people may think twice, and the incapacitation argument, no one who's been executed has ever committed another homicide. <laughs> so um, you can argue both sides, but you're not really talking um, anything very sensible with, in making those arguments. I think if we could incapacitate people in other ways long enough uh, that they probably do the trick, but the idea of an ultimate penalty to deter the worst offenses still, uh, still carries some, um, some utility. If we just put everyone in jail, regardless if they did one murder or 10, uh, keep them in prison for life, then what special punishment is it for those who kill more victims or torture their victims or kill law enforcement officers? How do we up the ante for that group? It's either got to be the conditions of confinement, which the ACLU would never allow, 
or the privileges they have or um, bodily injury or death. So it, it's very hard to think of how do you enhance the penalty. So your concern is, is that when it is enforced, it, where somebody gets the death, it, it gets an, it, uh, it confined, that they eventually will get out, that they're really, it, we don't really confine them for long enough? I mean, is your, is your concern that? No, no, my concern is, if we're gonna concern someone who kills one person without torture, who's not a cop, for life, without parole, what more can we do to those who kill seven police officers or who torture a string of women? How do we make that a worse crime? That, that's an issue. You would like to have a bigger hammer to prevent worse crimes I see. to the extent you expect offenders are having some rational calculus. And that's difficult. So that's when you talk about enhancement yes. for the death penalty. All right, so let me just ask you this because it, when we look at Andrea Yates, you found her to be sane. You also, oddly enough, I mean, at first glance, and I'd like you to explain it, found um, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer to be sane. Yeah. And I wonder, and you also visited the crime scenes with Jeffrey Dahmer. I mean, it was incredibly thorough investigation, uh, something that I, I've never seen. I'm not that I'm the expert, but generally most psychiatrists, forensics, don't do an investigation the way you do an investigation, which is also why you're in demand. Um, so tell me, how do, how do you, how did you arrive to the, conclu the conclusion that Jeffrey Dahmer was saying? Well, you know, there's a lot of evidence, and there's evidence for every one of the victims he was tried on, and it took a long time to go through all that evidence in court. I had it synopsized in a notebook that's this thick that I had on my lap on the witness stand because there was so much detail. The, um, did the, you have the, to refer to your notes a lot? Yeah, I did. When you have that I'm, much material, now, yeah. Now I use PowerPoint so ah. I can look up. But the, um, the, the real issue there is that what Dahmer wanted to do, his goal, was to have men who were attractive to him, which basically meant good biceps, that was his favorite part, who <laughs> Whom he met everyone. No. <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't be joking about Jeffrey yeah. Dahmer. I've really so, gone low. Right. So the, um, the the key for him was that kind of guy whom he could fondle and cuddle with all night. His experience was that the men that he was able to hook up with wanted to get it on right away. Uh, some of them wanted it rough. Some of them wanted money. Some of them beat them up to get money afterwards. He didn't like any of that. The idea that a guy would be with him for 15 minutes and leave was abhorrent to him. He wanted to cuddle all night long. Maybe there would be sex, but that wasn't the key. The key was the cuddling, the fondling, the warmth of their body, hearing their heartbeat. That's what he was after. Now. When it came down to what he was charged with, he was charged with homicide. And for each one of the homicides, except one that occurred in a hotel room for which he denied any memory, he was so drunk, might have been in an alcoholic blackout. The others, he had a clear memory of having used them up to the extent he could for cuddling purposes and now they were sick or ill or were going to escape or get him in trouble. And for various reasons, he'd used up his opportunity to have a, an attractive uh, partner. And now, to his dismay, he would have to, to preserve his freedom, kill them and get rid of the evidence. To overcome his inhibitions against what he saw as awful, to have to kill them to save himself. He would get himself drunk on purpose so that he could muster the courage to kill them. Well, that's not an irresistible impulse, it's the opposite. He had normal inhibitions against killing. He knew it to be wrong, he didn't wanna do it, particularly not guys that he liked and who he'd used as involuntary lovers. So for him, the homicide was nothing like um, an insane case. It was a guy getting drunk to do something expedient and instrumental. Now, um, what about his sex life? His sex life was weird, no doubt about it. But 
at no point. Certainly for a man who likes to cuddle. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But you see, what he mostly did with them was cuddling. Yeah, that is weird. To get them to cuddle, he would drug them. And uh, when he could drug them in bathhouses, spend four hours, they'd come out of it, make a night of it. That was fine. He would have done that forever. If the internet had existed at the time, I think he would have met compatible guys and they would have cuddled and had a good old time. But he was trying it all the wrong way. He was waiting till closing at gay bars and then whatever hustlers were left that no one else picked up, he'd take home. Well, these were not nice people for the most part, and that's problematic. So, so it's just the idea that he it had to be methodical, in, or it's not that he's methodical, it's that he had an aversion to actually killing someone. And, and, and did you pick that up from not just, the, obviously, since you don't just rely on what somebody says, because that would be certainly something somebody would say in their own defense. Um, was how did you get that information that there was well, that aversion? I mean, is it just the drinking? Uh, it's the fact that he was drinking. Mm -hmm. It's the fact that he saw it as a waste, that he wanted to try to preserve as much of their humanity and reminders of them as possible. He began building, building a collection to try to not waste these men. Uh, so he was developing a collection of skulls that he tried to disguise through various processes of heat and enameling to be able to make them not look real and he wanted to display 10 skulls in his apartment. He, so uh, and that was to hold on to them? That was to hold on to a piece of them. Okay. He also took photos of them that he would look at uh, to remember them. And in fact the cannibalism for which he's famous consisted of eating a cooked fillet of biceps from a couple of the victims while looking at their photos to try to make them part of himself so that they couldn't leave him, to preserve them as part of him, which of course has some resemblance to religious rituals and has um, long been known as a kind of primitive incorporation mechanism. Well, that's interesting. Really disgusting, but interesting. Yeah. Um, the, <laughs> the next thing I wanted to ask you about, okay, so, but it seems like, actually, before I even go to the next topic, then it seems like for, in your case, and we actually talked about this, that if you look at your body of work, that almost everybody is found to be sane. Uh, no, that the famous cases are sane, but I've got bunches of cases nobody knows about who were insane. Um, and there's a reason for that. First off, when I'm working for the government, and for the last 20 years, it's more often been the government who contacts me about a case. If I find the person insane, the government has no choice. They have to turn over my report to the defense, and then there's no trial. Everybody agrees, they stipulate the person is insane, and they go to a hospital. There's a little hearing on the stipulation. Public never even hears about the case. They heard about a murder in the news. Next thing they know, person's insane. The only time you get a trial is when experts disagree. Now, if I'm hired by the defense and they don't like my opinion, they keep it a secret. If I find the person insane, they just fire me and keep it a secret. They can shop till they find someone who finds them insane. The government doesn't have that luxury of shopping for an opinion. They have to live with what they get in the first place. Most of the people who are in hospitals for the criminally insane were never tried. There was a stipulated verdict where both sides agreed this person's insane. Uh, only the ones where somebody says they're not insane and someone says they are ever get a trial. So to the public, it always looks like someone trying to get off who shouldn't, because most of the time that's right. But I have seen occasional cases where there was an actual contested, in trial, contested trial of someone who truly was insane and the government's trying to prove otherwise. That happens too. Was it difficult for you to blend your um, medical background with the legal um, one? Because I find when I talk to doctors, they just approach things so differently than the legal system. And I, and I wondered how you were able to understand and make that leap because it really is such a different and distinct way of thinking about things. I mean, yeah. and I know that from my own family, like when I speak to it, they just don't get it about how the legal system is gonna define things. 
Um, if I've made that transition, it's been kind of seamless, but I purposely avoided becoming an amateur lawyer. At the time I entered the field, there were a number of prominent people who held legal and medical degrees in several branches of forensic medicine, including mine. And I always thought they were kind of hacks at both. And I never wanted to be that. Uh, I always defined my basic sciences as psychology, sociology, criminology, and I had professional training in psychiatry and medicine, and um, didn't want to have too much depth of legal knowledge. So I know the tests the law proposes for what I care about. Sometimes I've read case law, I used to teach it, but I don't claim to be knowledgeable about the law. That's for the lawyers to instruct me. It's far more important that I bring into that courtroom background on the empirical evidence about criminal conduct at, than that I know about the law. All right, well, let me ask you also about the, what role the media plays in all of this. Because you actually, and, it, and it's not been covered very much, and, but as I was looking through, there was a, a small report where you talked about, uh, it advised the media on how not to cover <laughs> a mass murder um, killing. And, or a mass murder a situation such as Newtown. And you had a list of things that you told them and it is absolutely contrary to everything they do. Yeah. Uh, and, or we do. And I, it's something, I mean, I think in the last mass murder, the last most horrific one, the Newtown one, where the children were um, murdered, there was an effort by some of, in the media not to mention the killer's name. And that's about as far as they went. And it sort of only lasted a couple of days. Then we got to see tons and tons of pictures of the news media just camping out. They interviewed everybody in that town from the street cleaner to people that had no relationship to any of the victims, just anybody who was walking by that they could get in front of a microphone. And on your list, you said, if you don't want to propagate more mass murders, saying that this kind of um, coverage could lead to more murders, I, I have to assume from that peg, don't start the story with sirens blaring, don't have photographs of the killer, don't make this a 24-7 coverage. These are all things that happen every single time. Do everything you can not to make the body count lead the story. That's totally how they led. It's how they lead initially and it goes yeah. all the way to the funeral, especially with the children, which made you sick every time you heard the number, or made me sick. Um, not to make the killer some kind of anti-hero. I think they're doing less of that. Um, and do localize the story to the effective community. Um, they didn't do that. They say this is a small community, but it's like every other small community in America. Right. So they actually go out of their way to make, at least in the coverage that I've seen, and it's true in all the coverage, they make that part of the story that it may be a small community you haven't heard of, but it's just like yours. Yep. So it's coming to your neighborhood soon. So let me ask you, what has been the response to these? Um, and do you really think that the media coverage instigates more murder? Yeah, I think on this particular kind of media coverage of mass murder, I think there are three untoward effects. The first is copycat mass murders, and that's the one you're asking. I'll describe it, but I don't want to miss the other two. The other two are that that kind of coverage traumatizes viewers. Now, I realize they subject themselves to the trauma, but they are actually harming their viewers. If we could measure psychological harm in the sa with the same kinds of measures that we current have for, say, secondhand smoke, that kind of coverage of a mass murder does more harm than a million smokers secondhand smoke. It does more harm than high sugar soft drinks in the city of New York. Um, I don't know if Bloomberg would agree, but I get your I point. I don't care what Bloomberg says about this or any other point, actually. The, um, the harmfulness has never been measured of uh, the psychological impact of ordinary news. The only thing in this country where it's been measured appropriately has been the 9-11 coverage. Uh, the coverage of 9-11 clearly did enormous psychological harm. Now, you could say that all of that is um, attributable to the criminals who committed the crime, or you can spread the blame between the criminals and the media who inflict the repetitive uh, video and the repetitive emotional arousal, 
Or you can say that this is a kind of self-destructive act in which the viewer turns it on and watches and causes themselves symptoms. There are all different ways to argue about it, and as a society, we haven't figured this out. But make no mistake, people are harmed by watching this. Now, the third kind of harm is an altogether different one. It's that when there is such coverage of an event, whether it's Virginia Tech or Newtown, that is all the impetus politicians need to have, the press machine behind them, to pass stupid and ill thought out laws. Every time high publicity crimes drive a law, it's the wrong law. And this is um, something I've been watching my entire career, and it's one of the reasons that I try to stay clear of politicians. They're just trying to attach their name to whatever's in the news, and the actual outcome and the effects on the public and the well-being of the public are not their priority. They'll pretend it is, but that isn't true. I mean, don't you think, though, that after these events, they talk about passing gun control laws, but they don't generally pass? Uh, and I'd say thankfully, because of the kind that they try to pass. Um, I think this time there may be some movement toward um, background checks of a kind that are feasible. But um, all sorts of ill-considered legislation has been proposed around this. Did you have something in mind that you think is, is fruitful for these mass kinds of shootings? Well, like, gun control would be the dumbest idea for protecting what is, what against is mass the, shooting. The, what do you think is, the, if you are steering clear of them because they are just trying to use that tragedy to get their name in the news and, and to pass this bad, leg, as you said, this ill ill-conceived legislation, what do you think might be appropriate? Well, what are we trying to change? If, we're, if what we're trying to change is mass murder, I already know how to prevent mass murder, I can tell you that. It's got nothing to do with the weapons. Um, if we're trying to prevent school violence, I can tell you what to do about that. We know how to do that, too. If you're trying to prevent violence in America, well, we're already doing quite well at reducing it. So let's go to the first two. For mass murder? If you want to reduce mass murder, the most important thing to turn off is the copycat effect of the news. And um, the things you described earlier that I've been proposing for 20 years are precisely, I still believe, the right way to do it. Uh, local news stories that mention victim names, that give body counts, that talk about funerals, of course that local community has a legitimate need for some of that information. There is no reason on earth for people outside that county to know the names of the victims or to see the crying parents or to uh, hear all the details about the killer's biography. The effect of that extra unneeded information is uh, all the negative effects that I mentioned. Not just copycat, but also harm to viewers and also politicians going wild. So, um, and we know this to be true because of what happened with product tampering. In 1982, there was a criminal innovation of product tampering with cyanide put in Tylenol. It became the number two news story in history, second only to the Kennedy assassination, mm -hmm. and how many households were exposed to the information. By 1985, we had 3,500 tampering crimes a year. So an innovation that was marketed by the media produced 3,500 crimes a year at the peak. Now, not all those crimes were fatal. Many of them were hoaxes and threats, but they cost billions of dollars. I was in the center of this with, the, uh, with industry, helping them sort out the threats at that time. So I saw what they went through. Part of the way that that stopped was a wonderful set of conferences run by a now non-existent foundation that had uh, put together conferences of, the, of industry, of law enforcement, and of journalists to look at this problem and what can we do about it. One of the recommendations that they came to by consensus in every one of these regional meetings was we're going to localize the news on the wire stories, instead of calling it international or national, it's going to be called local or regional. And 
immediately the crimes dropped off. And now it's not even on anyone's radar about product tampering. So we can do this same thing with mass murder if we had the will and if the media had the will to stop killing people. I think they control this more than anyone. Now within an organization, we also can prevent mass murder by doing what um, my company, Threat Assessment Group, has been training organizations to do for 20 years. For 26 years, we've been handling cases one at a time. For 20 years, we've taught people, how do you prevent this? And it requires a top-down approach for the organization so that there are people who know what to do when they learn of untoward behavior, so that everyone in the organization reports untoward behavior, and, uh, and it's quite simple, but voluminous. So if we wait till uh, a student or a coworker makes a threat to kill other people, now we have a high risk situation to manage. That can be done. We do it three times a day at my office. Uh, with 100% success, by the way. But it's always high stakes. There's always a chance of one going wrong. Mm -hmm. There's always a chance people will be killed. Had, um, had the people who saw the signs that preceded the threat to kill reported what they saw, which is uh, typically bullying, harassment, insubordination, a host of ordinary management problems, those could have been managed in a, in a less expensive, less risky way to improve the performance of that employee or student, maybe keep them in school or on the job and not have to worry about violence. Maybe sever their relationship with the school or the workplace by terminating or expelling them. Um, do you see, and, if, but let me just ask you, then do you see any role for the media? I mean, what is the role of the media in these kinds of incidents? I mean, where, where can, what can they say? What should they be saying? I mean, because they're going to report it. I know they're telling them what not to say, but what it would be okay and wouldn't cause more of these kinds of crimes well, to happen. First of all, I think it's easy for print media. Print media can do what they've always done. They can to give the extent, the two guys that are left in print media. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, that was the way to have thoughtful, um, verified, complete sentence coverage with minimal emotional arousal. Only when they started using color pictures did they get into danger territory. It's the electronic media that have the ability to arouse emotions so powerfully that they can cause someone who has already been paranoid, depressed, a loner, blaming other people for all the problems in his life, mm -hmm. say to himself, yeah, that guy's just like me. I'm going to do it, and I'm going to kill more than he did. People are going to remember who I am. Now, of the 10 people watching the coverage who felt that way, only one of them will do it tomorrow. But that's one more than would have happened had there not been that coverage. Because in every audience with these saturation level stories, there are millions of people who are paranoid, and there are millions of people who are depressed, and there are millions of people who are angry, and there are tens of thousands who are paranoid, depressed, and angry, and armed. And all it takes is 10 of them to identify with this guy and say, I'll do it tomorrow to get one who does. So it's interesting. Do you think um, that the focus then by uh, the media on gun control is to avoid having to focus on themselves? No, no. I think that they're carrying out an agenda that many people have. It's been part of what any of us with a liberal education were trained to think. And it, you know, it's parroting what is supposed to be part of the liberal agenda. But if you actually look at the data and what we know about effectiveness or lack of effectiveness of gun laws, it would not support that approach. Okay. Um, let me switch to a different subject. 
something lighter, porn. Now, <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you because you actually said something that's kind of interesting and uh, about uh, the role, um, and I, uh, well, I'll just ask you what role you think porn plays in creating violent offenders and what is the relationship between a violent film, um, a, a sexually violent, and, and sexual violence, and what it, what is, what has your study shown you of this issue? Yeah, well, because it's a little bit out there. I thought, I mean, a little bit different than uh -huh. what I would have guessed. Um, well, the one one hazard, not to guess anything you're going to say for fear of usually being wrong. <laughs> you can't, you can't predict it. <laughs> well, on 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 porn, I, I've got a couple things to say. Um, one I've written, and it's part of the Attorney General's Commission on Pornography Report. Which is available, isn't it, to yes, the public? Yes, right. it and is. People can look that up. And, and there, it has to do with the health effects of the entire porn industry, which I think at the time I wrote that were very bad, that there were a lot of uh, sad health effects. Now, you're asking me about a specific thing, violence. Yes. I, I don't think that Penthouse and Playboy have anything whatsoever to do with violence. I don't think that nipples make people kill. <laughs> okay. I, um, I do um, think that there is a kind of um, erotic stimulus that poses some risks. And the kind of erotic stimulus that poses some risks is the kind that helps to teach people to um, merge their lustfulness with their cruelty. Now, we don't actually know, and this is a topic of a 10-hour lecture, we don't actually know what causes people to find cruel imagery arousing, except that some people learn some of that. In other words, we could ultimately know that there are genetic vulnerabilities or hormonal vulnerabilities to acquiring um, this, but there is no question that there are millions of people who can be turned on by pictures of coercive sex of a woman bound and so on. What we would not want to do is to popularize any kind of um, stimulating imagery that would encourage people to take sexy women and cut them up or kill them. Now, the sexy women part is what's typically called the pornography. The tie them up and kill them part is what can be on the networks. So um, we've got it all wrong in how the rating systems are used and what's on network TV versus cable. It, we'd be far better off if we showed no violence on network TV and plenty of nipples, which seems to be happening on cable, though they still have even more violence. The, the issue is that the, and I, my wife's going to be mad if I don't say genitals, <laughs> male and female. <laughs> okay. So the, the, um, the problem is the merging of the two. So back during the Pornography Commission, I asked Jack Valente, who was very powerful in Hollywood, right. what would he think? Would he take back to the industry a simple proposition? The proposition was a cooling off period that every filmmaker would agree that we would have a one minute or three minute, we can negotiate, cooling off period between that part of the movie that will give 80% of the males an erection and the time that the women is tied up or slaughtered. Let's just not make it sexy to bind, torture, or slaughter women. Could we do that? He blew me off. That's all I was asking for there. And that comes from a, a lifetime of study. You, is, that, is that something that you um, asked for when you're a consultant? If you're consulting on, say, Kiss the Girls, or do you talk to the... Um, I mean, on, on some of those movies yeah. that depict a murder, do you talk? And there's girls being bound up in that and forced and having, you know, being forced to have sex. Is that something that you would insist on if you're uh, helping to be a consultant? Um, Besides the realism of it, it depends on who I'm talking to. If I'm talking to someone who actually has control of that, I would try to push for it. But I don't get listened to about everything okay. I advise by the media or by All right, uh, producers. Well, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah. We're talking about. Um, 
I, you were talking about before. I think it's this Alfred Hitchcock formula from Psycho of turn on the man and then kill the woman that's the problem. I just want to separate those two. And that's because I know that some sexual sadists who commit vicious crimes acquired their taste for at least aspects of what they do to women from various media portrayals. Now, not always ones you'd label pornography. I wrote an article with a couple colleagues called Detective Magazines, Pornography for the Sexual Sadist. What we found, and this was just from case studies, is that some sexual sadists acquired their taste looking at the covers of detective magazines, which had attractive women, typically wearing lingerie, who were tied up and being threatened by a man. And that was a very sexy image to sexual sadists, and they'd use that for masturbation in childhood. So, so isn't that a chicken or egg, though? I mean, like, what came first? Well, it is, to some extent. But this article made the case well enough that that industry overnight changed. So that from that point on, detective magazines had as their standard cover imagery, sexy woman with a gun, which was absolutely a step in the right direction. Now, uh, it's true that people seek out their pornography. They seek out their media. It's not random which teenagers pick violent video games or, or watch violent movies or will sneak to get violent things they shouldn't be looking at. Um, they choose that in part. And so that does create a big chicken and egg issue. The research on the effects of media on aggression, and typically they're not looking at anything that matters. They're looking at whether you'd hit a, an inflatable clown balloon or something of that sort. Mm -hmm. um, because it'd be unethical to do the real experiment, which would require showing thousands of sex offenders slasher films. No scientist could ever get that past an IRB, but Hollywood does it with every release. You see the problem here? Yeah. It'd be unethical to do such a thing. I just have problems with telling people what to do when they're creating art, based yeah. on the fact that a small percentage of their audience has a proclivity to read it a certain way. And, and that's that when you say it to me, my mind goes right there. Yes, because um, the concern is that government would try to tell them what to do, and government shouldn't. And I think that uh, whether any of us should wish they would do differently might depend on how big is the effect. Well, every time there's been a measurement of an effect size of media and aggression, there is an effect, but it's not very big. So how much aggression in society can be attributed to video games and, and movies and TV and so on is some, but not a whole lot. Then it becomes a matter of how much do we want to tolerate? How much obesity are we going to allow in the population before we regulate? How much um, freedom to uh, be titillated with violence? do we want to allow before we regulate? Those are all policy decisions. I, I, and I have to go back to something that when we were talking about weapons and, and you were talking about mass murder, but I, I was curious because I left open a, another area which you totally could speak to, the issue of regulating um, uh, the sane versus the insane's access to guns because a lot of times after this happens, I mean, you do have people that are, are, are seriously mentally ill, I don't know if you would find them saying, I mean, you'd have yeah. to do all your testing to go yeah. beyond that. But certainly what we find out in the news is that they're seriously mentally ill and that people yes. knew it. And they still had access to firearms. Bingo. So do you have something to, uh, some way that you think that should be regulated? Uh, I absolutely think that that deserves tremendous attention. It's a very big issue deserving of attention. I'll tell you about the first study I ever did of this. I wish it had been done well enough that I had published it, but I just sent a bunch of my law students to, on a field trip to the Hospital for the Criminally Insane, where I had them take the federal firearms form, the yellow form every gun buyer has to fill out, and ask the questions on there to men currently incarcerated because they had been adjudicated mentally ill and dangerous to self or others. And I had them ask the questions. And one of the questions is, have you ever been adjudicated mentally ill or dangerous to self or others? 
And all of the incarcerated mental patients said no. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't the way to screen for it. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine. Right. <laughs> Well, it's just, it's, it's an interesting thing because um, it, it seems, yeah, I mean, it just seems also that once they are adjudicated mentally ill, then some states take away their firearms and some states don't. And to me, that seems like a really easy fix. I mean, where it just to err on the side of safety that you don't get that right back. I mean, there are other rights. We take a rate of felons right to hold uh, to own a gun we take away his right to vote i mean it seems like there could be some regulation once somebody is but is adjudicated to be mentally insane well i would say that's too high a standard okay. before we limit gun rights that's a very small percentage of the mentally ill who would ever meet that standard so what's and, the right one and that's where we have that's where we're going to have difficulty is finding the right standard and the right way to do it uh, having been committed to an institution or put on a 72-hour hold, maybe a lower standard that would be better. But even there, it's sort of random when someone's going to call the police or, or call the mental health system and get someone committed. Um, there are many, many mentally ill people who've never been picked up on a mental health hold or committed and who shouldn't have arms. But it, it brings us to another question, because it's not just the mentally ill. I mean, if I were the emperor, we would not allow firearms in the hands of people who um, were mentally ill, or drunkards, or drug addicts, um, or uh, who had um, no capacity for rational decision making for other reasons. But we wouldn't allow those people to vote either. What if we were to simultaneously strip some people of the rights to speech and voting and firearms? Could we ever agree on which criteria? Mm. Should someone be capable of voting but not capable of owning a gun? How could that be? Do we let the mentally ill vote but not own guns? I, I think we've got a lot of homework to do if we're going to take away rights guaranteed by the Bill of Rights from some of the population. And we're going to have a hard time reaching consensus on who should be permitted to vote and own guns. So this is a dangerous slope. For, I mean, there you go into the law as opposed to yeah. the mental health. Well, we have come to an hour. We actually went a bit long because it was so interesting. And I, I really wanted to, I, like you said, we could probably go on for days. There's so much to cover. I really appreciate hearing what you had to say. It was really interesting, and, and I appreciate you coming here because I, I learned a lot, and I know my audience learned a lot, and it just lets us step back and realize that it's not as simplistic as we think. And, and the way these stories, these really high-profile cases that you've been involved in have been covered bear very little resemblance to what actually happened. When I sit here and listen to you talk, I, I, my questions are based on what I read and what I've seen, and, and I'm off base a lot of the time. You know, Roger Edelman, who was the Hinckley prosecutor and who really taught me a great deal about how to go after finding the truth, told me before that trial began, have someone save the newspaper clippings for you, but don't read them during the trial. You don't want to be biased by the news and misled by the news. And what I found reading the stories afterward is that the news gave a story with the same names and dates and places but it was all wrong. And that's been true of every high profile event I've been around, and that's maybe 30 of them, that the news got names, dates, and places right, but not the real story. Well, it's a, it's a good lesson for the audience to realize and to view and something that we try to focus on in, in both of these shows, to look at the news and, from a very critical eye and wonder about different things that aren't substantiated correctly. I mean, it, it just wonder more about everything, be more critical. So Looking, thank you. It's yeah. terrific to look behind the news. I compliment you on doing it. Well, thank you, and thank you for being here, and thank you guys all for watching, and we'll see you next week on Crime Time. <laughs>